let me welcome you to this intimate discussion on technology and the social contract. So for those of you uh, who are in the room, it's a small uh, group of people, and therefore I hope we can have an interactive conversation around this topic. And I know that some people will be able to watch this also uh, through social media at some point. So the, the topic we want to focus on now is really how technology, the revolution in technology, about which we have heard different dimensions in the sessions that came before. We heard about how the health industry is being transformed through technology. We heard earlier on about how corporate social responsibility is being impacted by technology. And all of this is having an impact on what you might think of as the relationship between the individual and society, between the citizen and the state. And what is the, which is of course just another way of saying the social contract. And so the question that we would like to focus on in this discussion is how is the social contract, as we have known it, likely to be affected by the transformation in our lives that is going to come about through the technological revolution? Is it going to have just a small change in the sense that the contract will be the same but we will use technology in executing it, or will it actually transform the nature of the contract itself? And I think that is the, the topic that, that this uh, <coughs> panel that is here is ideally placed to, to bring to you. And I'd like to uh, start, <coughs> excuse me, by asking uh, the first of our speakers, which is Toby Sami, to talk a little bit about how the social contract as a concept has itself evolved and how you see the introduction of technology in our lives impacting on that contract. Then we will go to some specific applications of that in different dimensions from the other panelists and, and we'll come to uh, having then a conversation in which I hope all of you will also be able to participate. So let me turn to Toby. Th thank you, Masood. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, so my, the purpose that I'll try to do is just to probably give uh, an overview of uh, the whole definition of a social contract. Social contracts have been the basis of how we construct society. Every couple of generations, our social contract evolved to better reflect our social norms and values. For our grandparents, being on time was crucial for someone to be trusted. To some extent, it reflects the sort of narrative in the industrial economy, because if someone were to be late, it would mean that there would be a stop in production. Te technological changes first led to substitution of human and animal workforce for machines. Since the advent of advanced computers, we are now substituting human brain for advanced robots and algorithms. In the 20th century, liberalism was organized around three presumed pillars. Large corporate employees like Ford and General Motors had three things in common. There was internal pathways for employees for their upward mobility. There were unionized workforce that could collectively bargain on behalf of the entire community. And finally, a regulatory apparatus that was strong that would oversee big business and organize labor. This triad was the essence of the social contract then. In exchange for full-time work, most families were assured of basic level of welfare, social insurance, and upward mobility. This, the problem is that this tripartite agreement might not exist now. In the 21st century, both the online and offline, in both the off, online and offline world, work is increasingly organized, not in large factories, but rather in highly disaggregated and fragmented workplace. 
workers increasingly freelance and regulations are being left far behind the pace of technological innovation and economic transformation. This practice is referred to by many economists as fissured workplace. Last year, you, uh, about 400,000 drivers from, of Uber went for a class suit in the United States against the company on the, on the fact that they were treated as contract laborers and not as employees. And they demanded back pay and benefits. A judge proposed a hundred million settlement, and he said that if, if you don't settle, the cost of a, of a final settlement could be in excess of maybe a thousand times more. So what is the challenge that we face in, this, in, 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 in formulating new social contracts in this rapidly changing technological world? The main distributive tool that we had, that of prosperity trickling down from productivity to, to wage and labor, has ceased to function. And this is the biggest problem. The deep decoupling of productivity and wages is a fundamental reason that this, for this structural imbalance. Wealth is being concentrated in the hands of a few who own platform, robots, and algorithms. And those living off labor is struggling. This disenfranchised people are now beginning to constitute a new political class. They vote for more radicalized political options. And we saw that recently in Brexit, the, vic the vic victory of President Donald Trump, the rise of FNP in France. And this is basically due to this broad breakdown in trust. If wealth is concentrated in capital, some form of democratization of capital holding is absolutely necessary. So what does the future look like? Perhaps we have to be prepared now for new social structures and social contracts when technologies like blockchain and Bitcoin will become more ubiquitous. Blockchain will bring economics and technology together in a way society has never experienced before. Previous technologies like the internet allowed us to create openness and the exchange of information. Blockchain allows us to track and trace our interaction, economic transactions, and gives us power to disrupt aspects of our own social contract that we do not like. For example, removing the central bank as the creator of trust in our, uh, in our money. <coughs> if you look at the internet, it was more an exchange of information. Blockchain will become the exchange of assets and values. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toby. So I, th I think that's very nice because you've given us some of the big changes and I know that others in the panel might come back to, to some of the issues, particularly the one very important point that you raised about how the nature of employment is changing. And in fact, even the term employment may itself no longer be relevant in a future where more and more people are working in a different way. And I know that uh, at one point, actually, uh, Patrick might come back to, to that point as well. But before we go there, uh, let's go to the next uh, panelist. And I'm going to ask uh, Chang Te Wan to, to talk a bit about uh, his perspective on this issue, looking also at how all this is going to affect uh, the whole industry of communication and media, which uh, in a way is your background. So I look forward to your perspective broadly on, on this issue. I know you have a presentation yeah, that like you, you would like to use. Please. If you allow me. Of course. My notes uh, keep on slipping down. Hold this. I'm a newspaper publisher. I print about one million copies daily. It's a business paper in Kuwait.
Korea. And uh, I operate uh, three TV channels and uh, internet services and things like that. So I have about 15 million audience in Korea. So I give you these informations uh, so we can uh, understand better. Uh, I was listening to uh, medical people uh, before I start this uh, session, and uh, people talked about uh, fourth industrial revolution, uh, which was a big topic in uh, Davos this year. And uh, as you know, uh, fourth industrial revolution covers uh, IoT, uh, and uh, I just learned IOL, which means light and robotics sensors, uh, driverless cars, drones, and uh, genetic engineering, and fin technology. And uh, people are borrowing money from other people. That's uh, P2P uh, financing. Uh, you'll see a lot of these new uh, industrial revolutions uh, happening uh, here and there. So, as Simon said, uh, we're going to have a new type of uh, social contract. So I like to focus on social contract in uh, newspaper industry. Through these uh, industrial uh, revolution, uh, MK, uh, meaning my newspaper, media group, uh, I'm going through lots of uh, innovation strategy. 24 hours, seven days, mobile platforms. Uh, that's one thing. And uh, we hear a lot about uh, Ubering taxi, but uh, I suggested uh, Ubering uh, professors, uh, expertise people, and even students and specialists. So I named uh, Ubering, Knowledge Ubering 300. I tried to gather about 300 people uh, they can help me out. Uh, I have about 700 uh, journalists working for me, uh, adding uh, 300 more would be a good idea. So I try to build knowledge community network. Uh, that's uh, what I call here uh, knowledge Ubering uh, 300. Then I try to introduce uh, radar series. Uh, uh, laser, laser ray uh, goes deeper into uh, many places. So I introduce uh, radio series. Uh, that's a new news platforms uh, specialized in politics, law, finance, uh, consumer behavior, and health. So I even set up this uh, uh, venture companies, uh, small ven venture companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, I hope uh, that will uh, make me a little more money than uh, newspaper business. Uh, next uh, picture is a very uh, complicated one. I didn't bother to translate uh, all the uh, Korean words into English. Uh, you probably wouldn't understand this. But my media platform is called Service Journalism. I try to map media uh, going through this uh, new fourth industrial revolution. Newspaper will introduce robot journalism, uh, and they'll go through uh, all these new ventures. Because uh, traditional uh, paper newspapers uh, don't make much money lately, and the subscription is declining. Uh, they really have to find uh, new ways to support uh, their journalists and their employees. So mapping meaning uh, planning course of action in detail, and I'll come back to this uh, later. Now we are facing a new medium era, you know, Google and Face. Uh, actually, whenever you use Google and Facebook, iPhone, uh, you are entering new uh, individual social contract. Uh, that's very complicated. Uh, nobody reads them. Uh, you maybe start reading uh, first page, then uh, going through several pages, you are tired, you just say yes, but you don't know uh, what you're getting into. Uh, you know, Google and Facebook, uh, 
uh, make up about 70% of the digital marketing industry. Uh, they are taking all the revenue money from traditional newspapers. And Netflix has become the biggest uh, global multimedia company, offering services in over 140 countries. So what's happening in the media industry is uh, media is going through a big deal, M&A. Okay. AT&T just purchased Time and Warner for $85 billion. And uh, Verizon has announced that they plan to buy Yahoo for almost $5 billion. And Disney is also expected to merge with CBS to multiply its size. And Nihon Gezai Shimbun of Japan, uh, they acquired Financial Times of UK for $1.3 billion dollars. So many uh, mergers and acquisitions are happening in the area of a traditional media. And I learned that uh, content is king. Uh, everybody in this media area is saying uh, quality of contents is decreasing lately. Uh, so I said the flood paradox, uh, meaning uh, there is no drinking water available uh, during extreme floods. So there are many platforms uh, need uh, contents, but quality contents aren't that many. So newspaper is going through many uh, strategic reforms, and the first one is convergence. Uh, we try to integrate platform, online, offline, and mobile platform. And uh, we try to network platforms and tight-knit horizontal and vertical networks. So in, in the end, we hope to converge your quality contents with the platforms and marketing services. So I checked the uh, most recent technological uh, advancement. And uh, as you know, uh, MIT Media Lab is always in the forefront. And uh, there is a new idea, software, uh, effective computing. Effectiva is the emotion recognition software and analysis startup uh, created by the MIT Media Lab. Uh, what they're doing is uh, software is uh, interpreting humans' emotions, facial expressions, age group, and even gender. So we just before talked about customized, personalized medicine. Uh, in the news business, we are trying to deliver same thing, customized, individualized, precise news to fit the needs of uh, all the uh, uh, readers in this area. What about uh, location-based services? Uh, we are here in uh, Doha, Qatar. Uh, you give your location to Google. Uh, you might find uh, your favorite restaurants and shopping places. And uh, many newspapers around the world, they go through uh, VR journalism, uh, virtual reality, and uh, the sizes are getting smaller and smaller, and eventually they'll come down to contact lens size. And uh, last year, uh, World Association of uh, Newspaper Congress, uh, we talked about this uh, VR journalism, and uh, this is going to be a big thing by year 2018. What about uh, mobility and IoT? Everything's mobile these days, and uh, we have screens everywhere. Uh, display technology is getting advanced rapidly. Mirrors, windows, desk, and uh, automobile uh, windows, they are all becoming a news platform. And the company Cisco predicted in 2016, uh, videos will make up about 78% of all contents by 2020. 
So you, you'll uh, have a ubiquitous uh, newspaper uh, here and there. So uh, publishers of newspapers, uh, we are going through lots of headaches, uh, whether we are well prepared for new uh, technological uh, reforms, revolutions. Uh, some people say solutions lie, lie outside of media. And uh, media is well known for mass media, okay? We can uh, uh, deliver uh, news in huge amount of quantity. But now uh, we are going through microculture era. So the microculture, uh, so we change from mass media period to micromedia uh, era. So microculture is becoming an uh, important area in this uh, new business. So I was just saying uh, social contract shift happening. So I like to draw some conclusions here. Uh, the purpose of the social contract was to negotiate how political power and resources will be distributed in, on, in society, okay? The basic role of new social contract in the 21st century is to illustrate the distribution of information in our society. Uh, media has become the fundamental platform of the 21st century social contract. Media will be the key player in helping individuals and societies communicate and exchange information for positive social development. Okay, political power and resources were money in the past, but now knowledge and information and new actions will be money in the future. So many years back, uh, Mr. Bill Gates worried, worried about the uh, uh, future of a newspaper. He said the uh, newspaper will disappear in 10, 15 years. But as you all know, uh, paper newspaper is still around, and uh, we take uh, different formats to go everywhere. Uh, the picture I showed here is a Jibo. Uh, it's another product from uh, MIT Media Lab. Uh, Robert Jeeva uh, is a sort of a casual conversation type. Uh, they feature families' visual features, voices, and behaviors, and uh, so analyzing data and collect data so they can uh, really become a member of your family. I think uh, we'll have a uh, infinite interactions with uh, robots, users, and uh, big data and things like that. And uh, Google and other those uh, media companies will collect these data and they're gonna provide customized contents to help create knowledge societies and advance people's everyday lives. I think media will continue to innovate through its unending quest for knowledge. And again, okay, I show you this uh, media platform. Uh, this is sort of my new social contract with my readers. And uh, lastly, I'd like to mention a little bit about uh, global governance and media. Uh, this morning I had uh, so many speakers saying, future is uncertain and unpredictable uh, because of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, he's becoming a president in next January. And many people are afraid of him. You know. why, why are you afraid of him? I think we are afraid of him because trust has shifted from established institutions okay, to individuals, well-educated people, not trusted anymore in the United States, in France, maybe in South Korea too. 
So we have a big shift from elite leaders to outside leaders, uh, so-called unfiltered leaders. President-elect Donald Trump, his conversation was unfiltered. But if you see him on CNN these days, he's much more elegant. And uh, he really looks like next president of the United States. So in the fourth industrial revolution, I call this uh, digital age, uh, your money and power uh, derives from uh, data and information. And the newspapers will uh, provide you with uh, data and this information. And uh, if anybody tried to suppress the freedom of press, uh, I think he'll regret it for sure. Uh, again, last year in uh, Colombia, uh, we had this uh, World Newspaper Congress. And uh, we give awards every year for promoting uh, freedom of press. And this time, a Russian journalist received a Golden Pen Award. And he made a very I interesting comment. He said, 85% of Russians don't know about the freedom of press is a very important factor to elevate people from poverty. So I try to connect uh, press freedom to uh, global uh, governance. And uh, we need to think about this idea. Thank you. industry is changing and I think you raise one point which I hope we come back to when we have a conversation which is that the knowledge and data is the source of power and influence for and more but knowledge and data is being collected from all of us every day everything we do is being mapped and transmitted and aggregated and forming part of the big data. And we may be entering into many social contracts, as you said, without even fully understanding what we have entered into. And the consequence of those individual decisions to be part of this big knowledge and data establishment is in essence to confer a lot of power to the people who can collect and manage that data. So what is the role of the state as we have seen it in the past in governing that process? How does that process affect the relative roles of corporations, states, individuals, other pressure groups, other lobbies, in the way in which society is organized. I, I hope we'll come back to that in the discussion. Let me turn now, if I may, to, to Patrick. And Patrick, if you could give us your perspective, and I know you will also focus a little bit on how the technological revolution is changing the nature of the workplace. Yep, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Uh, first, a preliminary comment on the topic. I said, uh, uh, man is a creature of habit, and uh, this explains you always have a gap between the new technology and its adoption by the society and its citizens. So uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, being with Capgemini, Capgemini is a 12.5 billion revenue ser IT services company, but that means we have 185,000 employees today, out of which 95,000 uh, in India. So my focus on contribution will be on automation and labor, which is often talked about. And uh, I'll start with a few observations and propose then uh, two paths forward, uh, possibly. The first is on automation. You, you, we hear a lot, we talk a lot about automation. I say there are, in IT, this is the essence of IT. Automation is the essence of IT. And uh, there are three types, we look at it, uh, three types of automation. One that is known for long, this is where you monitor. You monitor systems, you monitor activities, it exists for decades. Now you have a new type, 
of automation. This is everything related to industrialization. You first saw it on the shop floor, now you are seeing it in the IT shop floor. Uh, this is how you do robot process automation, IT process automation. And then there is a third that is the most talked about. This is everything called cognitive. Cognitive is artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, predictive analytics. This uh, era, uh, uh, area exists only since we have big data because uh, otherwise you have no use case, you have no economic case to invest whatsoever in cognitive technologies. This is only the amount of data and the value you can extract from it that has uh, allowed uh, this development. What we are seeing now is not an incremental development. What we are seeing now is a combination of these different types of automation, and that's what is uh, hurting, notably, uh, the labor market. And when you look now economically on what automation is and uh, related to labor, the first most evident, that uh, obvious one that uh, is much talked about is efficiency. Efficiency is about cost savings, it's about productivity improvement. So yes, this is eliminating labor. But there is a second business value, which is efficiency. Efficiency is all about the quality of your processes, about the productivity. It affects uh, labor, but not in the same way. It even creates new opportunity. And the third element uh, is about the business outcome. It completely changed uh, business model. It completely changed industries. We just heard about media. We hear about hotel or entertainment or the way you will define it, Sebastian. So this is generating uh, uh, opportunities for new type of activities. So. Automation is not just one word. We need to look at the three by three approach, possibly the way I just described it. Now the impact on labor uh, is, is massive and is uh, multiform. The first one uh, we see is uh, the, the relationship, notably of the new generation to uh, the employer. The employee-employer uh, contract is disappearing. We are recruiting now uh, people in their mid-twenties who state, arriving with us, uh, our ambition is to have four employers' uh, experience by the age of 30. A few years ago, everybody would come and say, I want to make a career, I love your company. So here, what you see, the shift socially, is that the people think what matters most is to enrich the ability to network. They know they are on their own, and they know that they have to build their own currency. And in this respect, I would like to give one example. In the Valley, there is a company called Geekster. Geekster is a network of geeks. There are about thousands of the top schools. They are all freelancers. And uh, they are, 60% of them are Airbnb all year long. They don't even have a personal address. They travel, they work 60 to 80 hours per week. And uh, this company has established something called, uh, which is a currency called Karma. And these members, these top developers, are more fighting to get the currency, the Karma currency, that increase their value than fighting for the remuneration on the job. Remuneration matters, obviously, but it shows this importance of this networked economy and the importance of the individual aspect. I mentioned in automation, uh, the, the, the third part, notably uh, around uh, the cognitive, uh, these are in fact powerful tools, as you've seen in the previous uh, uh, session on healthcare. Uh, the, these are extremely powerful tools. These create opportunities, what we call it the augmented workforce. So the workforce today has the ability to do much more, not only in volume, as we've seen with the, with the Geno, but also uh, in quality. So that creates new opportunity. For instance, mathematicians have jobs outside of financial services. Uh, effectively, they have jobs everywhere, uh, which was not the case before. Of course, there is a kind of segregation. So the challenge is on reskilling. And here, this is a pretty unfair picture when you look at uh, labor, the labor situation, because there are people who have the ability, the, the, some core competencies uh, to be reskilled, and every company, is, I believe, and certainly ours, is investing massively in reskilling because you have, you have a good business case in reskilling. Unfortunately, 
there is a significant percentage that we will not be able to rescale, and that will create uh, a question for the company, notably in terms of cost, but also for the society. Then at the opposite, you have a talent war. The talent war is global. It has always existed uh, when we had uh, an increase in technology evolution. But here, I said, uh, Toby comes from Bangalore. You look at Bangalore today, it was a hot place for outsourcers. Now it's a hot place for everything. It's a hot place for startups. Uh, India GDP is growing by 7%. Good monsoon this year, it will continue to grow next year. So uh, FDI is increasing. So if you look for talent in Bangalore, be ready to pay. It's extremely expensive. It's free. And wherever you go, because, uh, and that was what was mentioned before, uh, it's micro-media possibly and certainly, but it is micro in everywhere. You have micro-ecosystems for every type of solution, and so you need specialists. And there is this uh, uh, dichotomy between the population we had before, and I mentioned the reskilling, and now uh, what you need to do. One example, for instance, there is a company also created by a French uh, entrepreneur based in the West Coast called Upwork. I was um, while working with them. I was looking for a blockchain expert, as to be mentioned, uh, on Upwork. I found someone in Kerala. In Kerala, he was charging by the hour what we pay by the, by the day. So, but it's normal because he's on a global marketplace. So even if he delivers from Kerala, it doesn't matter because he has skills that are in demand globally. So he can charge, command the premium. Then there is another, two other more uh, social aspects. One is uh, uh, the labor part uh, and the taxation of labor. We heard the comment earlier on, uh, the, from uh, the Deputy Secretary of OECD. Um, it, it fund a big part of our welfare system. Uh, with all these changes, it will create a gap. And uh, we will have to address it. Uh, and if we look at the success uh, or lack of success of ideas such as the tax tobin, I doubt that the answer is to have a tax on machine transaction or transaction per machine. But there will be a gap because this notion of employer uh, status funding uh, the welfare system will be hurt by this transition. And lastly, last observation is that all what I describe is very similar to what we call or what we see in other aspects of the so-called shared economy, what we see in transportation, what we will see, you will hear in entertainment or hoteling. In fact, these are uh, technologies that allow to target economic inefficiencies and transform them in pool of uh, profit. That's from my definition of shared economy. A uh, little, maybe a caricature, but uh, at least uh, it's simple enough. Uh, and then, uh, labor is inefficient today. The labor market is inefficient today, and it's a huge volume of, uh, of spend. The total spend is massive. So expect, with this new generation also that, have, that has understood it and positioned itself for this, the problem for society is, of course, the new generation. We heard about unemployment in some geographies, and we know it, but it's the whole uh, lifespan uh, with also the more senior population. So two uh, ideas that we see. One that I try to put into practice, it's a very difficult one, is that I don't believe anymore in one employ employment status. We'll have to go to something much more granular. Uh, we'll have a diversity of status. Today we know an employment status, civil or private company, you're an independent, you're temporary, uh, by the way, that was already a first attempt, or you're unemployed. Uh, today, we will have tens of different status, and this is a big challenge on to adapt to it. I, see, I cite only one uh, issue, is pension. Uh, how do you manage, if this model will remain, how do you manage it? But I believe the multiplicity that will allow the flexibility based on the, to address the situation that I briefly described in my few observations is needed. The second, and I will finish with this, but uh, it's more well known, but I think it's interesting if you have questions to debate, is a basic or universal income. Uh, I'm Swiss, we voted massively against it, 77%, because it was too early, it was ill-defined. But Finland will, uh, will make pilots. 
And, and I think this, uh, this, is, this might be an interesting avenue, but that implies a disconnect between labor and revenue. But there is a social challenge and there is a disconnect that will need to be addressed. So, Mr. Moderator, my short contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, it would be interesting to ask yourself, in 10 years' time, now you say you have about 185,000 employees. In 10 years' time, do you think you'll have 180,000 or more people associated with you, but how many of them will be employees? You know, it's a, it may only be 185 or 1,850 or, or 18,500, and, and I think that's part of what you're getting at. I will not comment because uh, we have to address it with the International Workers' Council before, but uh, absolutely, this is a, a big debate right now. Thank you. And, and you also, I think we should come back to the question you raised about uh, what this implies for the way in which we think about old age security and pensions. And, and I would say in the United States, for example, for most, for many people, if not most, their health insurance is linked to their employment status. So if they change jobs, they move to the employment plan of their new employer. Now, if more and more people don't have employers, what does that mean for the way in which we think about health, pensions, and a variety of things which traditionally we have associated with the relationship between individuals and the place in which they work assuming that that relationship would be stable and long-lasting. And now, as you say, it is changing quite dramatically. Uh, let me now uh, go to our last uh, uh, speaker, who is uh, Sebastian Bazin. And Sebastian, I know you're going to make a use a PowerPoint for your presentation. It works? Yeah, I don't have any PowerPoints, but I feel better standing up. So um, let me tell you at least what we're facing. I'm the chairman CEO of a big hotel company, and we have 240,000 employees in 95 countries. If I want to resume, summarize the last 20 years, what happened basically since 2000? Just bear with me a second. 1960, 2000, all the hotel companies in the world, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, Intercon, Accor, were actually created in 1960s. For 40 years in a row, we benefited from 90% of the profit pool, 10% went in the hands of traditional travel agent, of which we paid them a 10% commission. And that lasted for 40 years. Easy game with a growing industry, which is the travel and tourism industry. In 2000, what happened? Well, you had a first digital mutation, which was the online travel agencies, Booking, Expedia. They did not invent, I mean, invented anything extraordinary. They just had a new technology, a better machine, a better equipment, far greater than what existed into the traditional travel agent. And they made it global. And we as hoteliers felt it would be wonderful because it would be easier access for the guest. Five years later, MetaSearch. You know all those online platforms in which you can compare pricing? You have Kayak, Trivago, TripAdvisor. And there again, we felt it was extraordinary for the guest because they can make a better choice and an easier choice. And there again, we did not react as hotel companies. And then six years ago, third mutation, third revolution, different nature. The first two one were based on technology. The last one, it's called the sharing economy, Airbnb, where different from the first two revolutions, they decided to change the model. 
to invent a new sort of accommodation. You no longer go to a hotel, but you go to somebody's home. And it works. And you look at 2016, the same profit pool I talked to you about, which being 90-10 between the hoteliers and the travel agent, today is 5% for travel agent. I went down from 90% to 70%. And all those digital players, they today have 25% of the profit. And no one can say it's unfair because we could have seen it coming and we did not react. And I guarantee you, you do the exact same mathematic in 10 years. You don't have to wait another 15 years. My share will go from 70% to 50%, undoubtedly. Well, and no one's going to stop it. And I've been saying, and as chairman CEO for the last three years, that no one should either say, I mean, should say that it is a threat. Yes, it is much more an opportunity than a threat as long as you decide to participate into it as long as you decide not to be a spectator of your own environment, but to be an actor. So you need to basically participate in this growing pie going from 25 to 40% of profit. Well, now it has another implication on social issues, which is what, we just, what the topic is all about. Booking.com, and I'm very friendly with them, so I'm always Expedia, so my charge is not against either of the two because we partner with them. But if you pause a minute, Booking.com, which only existed for the last 20 years, has today a market cap of roughly $80 billion, which is more than all the hotel listed company together created 50 years ago. But much more noticeable than the market cap, because the market cap is a reflection of your growing factor. All those big listed companies, Hilton, Marriott, Starwood, Intercon, Accor, Hyatt, Choice, Wyndham, we probably have two million employees. They have less than 1%, 20,000. So I am a firm believer that all this new technology is extraordinary. All this new technology is enhancing quality of life. All this new technology is being sought after by the millennials because they want it, because they create it. But I'm also convinced that you're going to have more job destruction for the next three to four years that you're going to have job creation. You have a lapse of time for people to adapt to this new evolution because companies like ours, look at all these hotel companies. We have two things they don't like to have. We are capital intensive, we are labor intensive. All the companies you can think of who did not exist 25 years ago, they don't have capital intensity, they do not want to have labor intensity because they don't want to depend on any legislation locally that they don't understand. And they don't want to pay the, they don't want to pay the price for it. And if you go one step further, it also has impact on government officials because they also have a lot of jobs. And technology could also replace the jobs they have in their own administration. And they can't adapt to it as much as I cannot adapt to it. So if you want to simplify it for my big company, which I endorse and I love doing what I'm doing, it basically could regroup my 240,000 people in three buckets. A third are extraordinary locomotives. They understand the new world, they understand the new technology, and they actually want to participate into it. And they probably could be initiators in moving things around, and probably be ahead of the game, and probably be an actor of your own environment. I have another third of my company where they understand the new world, but they do not know how to participate. They need to be trained, they're asking to be trained. They're going to be great soldiers, but they won't be locomotive and have one-third blind. They do not want to see what's going on. They do not want to be trained. They're very happy with the process they've been enjoying for the last 50 years, and you have to bring them with you even though it's a heavy burden. Same thing in all the big administration in all the mature countries. They're facing the same three issues. So as much as I am pushing for new technology, I'm saying you have to adapt which gets to one conclusion. 
which is the toughest part, has nothing to do with money, has nothing to do probably with age, has to do with model. What is it that differentiates the old economy to the new economy? And I'm putting aside purposely technology. One thing, all those new companies who got created were created by on a blank sheet of paper by less than 35 years old people. No legacy, no inertia, no processes, no history, no people. 100% of the old economy, we have hundreds of thousands of people, we have processes, we have inertia, and we have history and culture. The impact of those differences is the following. The new company have a horizontal organization. They share ideas. They innovate together. They speak to each other. You don't keep a secret and you move. It's called agility. All the old traditional companies, we have a vertical organization, pyramidal, hierarchy. Whomever has a secret, you keep your secret because it gives you status. It gives you power. If you don't change the old economy, from vertical to horizontal, you will never be able to adapt to the new world. Well, Sebastian, that was certainly a sobering message. So, I think you have had a very interesting perspective from different speakers on how they are dealing with the challenges that are faced by technology, both at the company level, at an industry level. And what would be good now is to try and bring you in directly into this conversation. And I'd like to encourage you to ask your questions, and we'll try and get maybe three or four questions and then come back to the panelists and then go back out again to make it more interactive. So let me start with the lady in the first row, then I'm going to go to the gentleman in the third row, and then we will take it from there. So if you could please bring a microphone to the lady in the first row. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Iman. I think we had a very live uh, panel speaking today. Uh, I will have this one is a comment and then a question, then a doubt. The comment says that uh, the CEO of Nokia, when they were about to close down, he had a small statement to his employee. He said, we have done nothing wrong, except that we do not change. And Nokia now is not known anymore, especially to our new kids. The second thing is that, that was my comment, that there's no, if we don't accept the changes, they will vanish. That's the statement and the message. But then, and a few months from uh, Brit exit to uh, the United States election, there was another shocking message that people refuse to change. And uh, the new words is either support Donald Trump, the person who brought a new change, and the Brit exit. And the reason that they've been elected and the reason that uh, the United, uh, United Kingdom, United States refused the changes, the people refused through the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the election, the free world election, they refused the changes. And the most changes refused was by elderly, non-educated, people who have lost their jobs, People were affected with globalization, the changes of the new world. Now, the, the, my doubt, how would uh, the speakers elaborate with the new generation saying that the changes is good, but the, the people who elect in democracy countries refuse to do the change? How would you speak to them? Thank you. My name is Chal Gi uh, from Korea. I was a former public official and now I'm president of the Overseas Korean Foundation. 
uh, I uh, was very much impressed with the uh, expose by different speakers. And uh, because of this fast change and uh, because of the delay of adaptation and difficulties, uh, really a lot of challenges are there. And, uh, but uh, our uh, social uh, contract or our labor uh, union, for example, uh, try to resist uh, any necessity of reform and change. And government sector also tries to uh, bring uh, some new reform and uh, restructuring, but sometimes they didn't, uh, they don't understand the gravity of the situation. And the leaders uh, also fall back in tackling these issues and that creates the gap and uh, that leads up to the political uh, problem that we see today, potentially. My question is uh, how the organizations such as OECD and ILO, uh, even the labor, international labor union organizations uh, uh, take this issues seriously and study and uh, uh, embark on efforts to educate people, political leaders, uh, other, other social leaders, uh, NGOs, and the labor union people for the better of the uh, entire uh, society. So my question is about education. What the international organization is doing about that? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll take one more question from that gentleman over there, Mr. Dadush. Yeah, uh, Uri Dadush from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I have a question actually for uh, Sebastian Bazin. Um, I'm very interested when you say that we're going to see a lot less, a lot of change that will affect your employees. Uh, where you see the change? Because I assume in a hotel chain like yours, you have a lot of people who do things that are not going to be replaced by robots or computers or whatever, and others that are. So if you could give us some kind of your view of the distribution of where this burden will fall, uh, I'd be very interested in that. Thank you very much. Uh, Uri. We have uh, three questions, and if I may, I don't see anybody's hand up, add a question of my own, and therefore turning back to the panelists. And I guess my question is that, I think what all of you have pointed out is that there is a transformation in societies that is happening because of technology, in different ways. And some companies, some people, will do remarkably well from it. Other sectors, other companies, other people will be impacted negatively and they will try to adapt. Some will adapt well, some will not adapt well. This process will take a decade, if not more, depending on where you are, which sector, which country. How do you bring about a conversation at the societal level that will create the most harmonious conditions for managing such a existential transformation. Because if you are in booking.com, to take Sebastian's example, they don't see why they should be worrying about the social contract as it affects the employees of the hotel industry. And if you're in your industry, you are simply managing your problem. But how do you create the societal discussion that would bring about a new social contract that recognizes this new reality, but also recognizes the inherent and quite complex difficulties of surmounting these problems without Res resulting in the kind of rejection that is only something that can hold back the flood for a while, but it cannot change the course of the, of the, of the water. So uh, let me add that question, if I may, and, and I'd like to just go down in order and ask each of you to address any of the questions that uh, have come to you. So I'll start with, uh, uh, with you, Toby. Uh, from you. 
the challenge is more that organizations are guided by profits more and more because you have uh, the financial sector, the private equity funds, the venture capital coming into play. And, and they are extremely conscious of the return that they are making. So when it comes to uh, decentralization of any sort of wealth, uh, you know, you, you see increasingly that people who have higher skills in organizations are paid much more, um, a multiple which is probably, uh, you know, maybe 100 times, 200 times more, and nobody complains about it. So who is able to regulate this? I, I think only governments can. So, you know, if you tell companies to do that, I, I think it would be very difficult. It would be a very onerous ask of them. To, this, the, to, be, uh, to answer your question about the, the politics of it, again, if you see the reason why uh, President-elect Trump won or or you know the, what happened in Brexit is more because of a lack of trust. People are increasingly fed up with organized structures, and they just want a change. And whoever is able to even suggest a change, articulate it well, is finding success. I mean, how long it will last, we don't know, but it is something that is let me say the flavor of the season. Whether it is in China, whether it is in Japan, whether it is in, 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 in many parts of the world, you, you are seeing this, and we might continue to see it again in future. Thank you, Thank you very much, Toby. Let yeah. Is my mic on? Okay. Uh, you know, I cannot answer all th those three questions, but uh, uh, I'll try to answer how to bring about change, okay? What's happening this uh, 21st century now is that uh, trust is uh, distributed. The amount of trust is uh, becoming less and less. And why we go to use Uber taxis and why do we go to Airbnb? Because we can have a trust, uh, transparent, accountable, and inclusive. You know. So we have some degree of a trust in these companies. So we use services they provide to us. But bring about trust is extremely difficult exercise. You know, I studied the business uh, for many years, and in this case, uh, I suggest sort of a dictatorial uh, management style to bring about tr uh, change in your companies. South Korea has a number one company called Samsung. They make uh, Galaxy cell phones and uh, you know, household electronics. Uh, it's a very diversified uh, number one group. They even uh, account for almost 25% of the Korean uh, GDP. Uh, it's a uh, number one, uh, I would say, super company. The chairman of this company, about more than 10 years ago, asked his employees, Change everything, except your wife and kids, <laughs> okay? So that's how Samsung built up uh, number one cell phones and uh, electric uh, equipments like that. One of the, you know, CEO, uh, he was uh, quite dissatisfied with the uh, old uh, cell phones. He burned up virtually hundreds of thousands of uh, cell phones in front of uh, his plant workers. Okay. That was an extreme shocking method to bring about quality control in Samsung Electronics. So 
You need uh, different types of management style in this case, bring about big change. Revolution, coup d'etat, democratic ideas wouldn't work. So in my case, in my newspaper, you know, I tell my journalists all the time, uh, bring about new change, adapt to a uh, fourth industrial revolution, but cannot do that. Uh, just sitting in uh, Seoul, South Korea. So I happened to send one of my smart journalists to Silicon Valley, and now he's sending me some change and ideas. And last time he was uh, running after Pokemon in Silicon Valley. And uh, every January, you know, in Las Vegas, they have a CES, right? And uh, I'm going to bring uh, many of my employees to CES to bring about new change. So I think we need to go to uh, Silicon Valley, Bangalore, Hyderabad for new change. And we even uh, talk to young kids. Uh, Sebastian said uh, uh, people uh, less than 35 age. But I would say uh, teenagers, you know, they're the one who bring change uh, this year, this time, okay? So another way of uh, you know, bringing in uh, change to your company may be uh, uh, forcing your employees to read newspapers. Newspapers still deliver good ideas and they can bring change and they can give you ideas how uh, new president-elect Donald Trump got to manage the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a struggle trying to convince young people to read anything but the, the feed that only feeds them what they want to, to hear from uh, likewise sources. Uh, let me turn to, to Patrick first, please. Yeah, I will uh, just carry on the first question. Uh, one aspect I have not mentioned is mobility. Uh, and mobility goes both ways, so that would be a message to a younger generation. First, <clears throat> you bring people to work. It's one way that drives a lot of mobility. And then it all depends uh, how protectionist it will be. You heard, for instance, uh, the upcoming uh, administration in the U.S. saying they would limit the visa uh, for in the technology sector. Uh, but that will trigger the other movement of mobility, is where you bring work to people. I mean, if people cannot come to the work, you, today you can bring work to the people. So this is a different approach. This is the approach of centers, of factories, different kind of mode. But in any case, the location of this center will not be determined by where you live. So <laughs> you will need mobility in one way or the other, and this will create movement, and it's another aspect of flexibility beyond the labor conditions. It's the mobility. If we, if we kill this, then we are uh, in, in, in big trouble. Uh, the, the second, or to the, your question, uh, fourth, is uh, what I, I advise across our organization is plan for disruption, execute for evolution. Uh, because th all these things we are changing cannot be addressed uh, uh, too much in a disruptive manner. There are ways. And I agree, some authority is needed to force the change, but you have the population that you have. So, but if you don't plan for disruption, then you miss the point. That's uh, and, uh, with the level of uncertainties that it contains. Thank you very much, Patrick. And then uh, let me go to Sebastian now, and including the, the question that I think Uri asked. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah. I remember. The... The answer to your question is the following. Big companies like ours will not destroy jobs. Probably to the country, we're probably gonna be continuing hiring people and we are core. We open one new hotel every 36 hours. So I employ another 20,000 people per year. The impact is not on the big change. 
the impact is on the small independently owned and run hotels, which is the vast majority of the hotel industry in the world. The only place when you have a majority of the chain market is the US. 70% in the hands of the five big guys. You take France, 70% of the French hotels are independently owned and run. You take Italy, 95% of the hotels in Italy are independent. And those independent hotels are lacking three or four things. They don't have technology, they don't have any money, and they don't have any expertise or talent vis-a-vis -vis the new digital world. So they, each of them, a bit naive way, accepted too fast to be in the hands of the online travel agency because for them it was a cheaper source access to clients, except that today they are totally depending on them to the extent of 50, 60, 70 percent of occupancy in, in the hands of those big machines. Since the cost of commission went up dramatically for the last five years, in order for them to keep sustaining and pay the price of that commission, they have to no longer maintain the property the way it was maintained before, or they laid off the marketing director or the people in charge of the local uh, sourcing. So since they cannot maintain the property, what's happening to them? Trip advisors downgrade them. They're being downgraded, so they are on page number five or page number 20 of the booking engine, so occupancy goes down. So 20%, a third of the independent mom and pop hotels are closing basically over the next five years. And that is one drop out of 10 in all the GDP of the major company, of the major geography. So. You, you see it coming. The benefit for me is if they die, I'm going to be enhancing my market share. And before they die, they're probably going to be knocking on my door to be distributed by AcroHotel.com to basically hide under my umbrella. But this is not the answer. And again, I'm not blaming Booking and Expedia. I wish we would have invented Booking and Expedia. I wish I would have invented Airbnb. But I'm just telling you, and which is even worse, 80% of the traffic goes in 300 cities in the world. 80% of the traffic goes on page number one and page number two of those websites. So if you happen to be in a tertiary cities on page number 20, you have very little hopes to survive. So, and, and to get back uh, to you on your question, sir, on what do you do then and how do you adapt? Well, there's two ways to look at it. The first way is all those new initiatives, be a participant co-partner, invent one of your own, because you're going to have new Airbnb of the world, which is why we have our own autonomous lab of which I'm hiring people to invent new products, new services away from a hotel room that companies never done before. We went into concierge digital, we went into one fine stay, which is private economy. So you need to expand your presence and your market share in something different from what you're accustomed to, which is difficult, but you can do it. The second is what you alluded to, uh, Chairman Chang, and you're so correct. I keep saying it's between 25 and 35 years old, and they're very good. But I also know that those today between 5 and 15 will be far better than those today between 25 and 35 years old in 15 years. Not because they're smarter, but the, that, that new generation has something very defined. They have a predictability of the future, which is 20 times better than mine. Because if they want something which does not exist, they will create it. So in order for me to think like that new generation, you have to identify who are they in your own organization. I, and I have 60% of my people are underneath 35 years old, except they haven't been identified, they haven't been recognized, and you don't give them authority. So you have to identify them, you have to give them breathing room, oxygen, autonomy, and discretion which is why I'm talking to you about culture. You have to get the elderly generation to accept that they waited 25 years to get direction. Well, we're not going to be imposing 25 years for the young people before he's going to get autonomy, otherwise he's going to be leaving you. So you need to basically have those two generations to talk to each other, where the young people respect the old because he has wisdom and experience, but when the old people accept to give power much sooner than he expected, probably in the next two to three years. So that dialogue between those two generations is indispensable. All right, thank you very much. Well, this has really been a fascinating discussion. 
And I'd like, unless there's pressing questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists. And I'd like to ask each of you to go away with one question for yourselves. And that is, we've got a glimpse of the nature of the societal transformation that lies ahead in each of our countries. In your own mind, how well prepared do you think your country, your society is to deal with this transformation? So on a scale of zero to 10, would you say at the end of this conversation, you think that you are closer to 10, you're somewhere in the middle, or we haven't yet actually formulated the scale. So with that, I want to ask you to please thank the, the panelists.